If you've watched our videos before, you've seen that we put out lots and lots of videos on tips and tricks. And today I wanted to get into some more advanced topics that we have covered, maybe in some of our shorts, maybe in some of our long form, and then some brand new stuff that you've probably never seen before. I don't care if you're brand new to raising sheep and goats or if you've been doing this for 20 years, I guarantee in today's video, we are going to give you some tips and tricks that you have never heard before. Stay tuned to find out more. Hey everybody, it's Tim from Lenosa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. If you haven't joined us before, make sure to check us out. We're going over quick tips and tricks. We're just gonna walk around the farm and I'm gonna hit you with them as hard and as fast as I possibly can. First thing I wanna talk about is giving shots. Now we've talked a lot about giving shots before and a lot of people think that you need to give shots in the rump. The actual preferred area to give a shot is gonna be right up here in the neck. If you find the ear and find this crease right here and you find the jugular notch, which is right here, it forms a triangle. It goes down like this, over, and then back up. The best place to give your IM shots is going to be right in the middle of that triangle. We're gonna use a short three quarter inch needle. We're gonna go right in there. So why would we give an IM shot in the neck as opposed to in the rear end. Well, very well defined muscle tissue up here. Not a lot of nerves that we have to worry about damaging. Not a lot of major arteries or veins. When we start to get back into the hindquarters, we take a very large risk of doing damage to this quality meat cut. Plus there's lots and lots of vasculature and arterial flow that goes down in this area and nerves. So again, if you're given an IM shot, Think about giving it up here in the neck. Next tip that we're gonna talk about is our subcutaneous shots. So if you're gonna give a sub Q shot, we want you to give it here along the flank. You can pull out some of the skin and give it here, but we don't ever wanna give our shots on the show side. So the sheep's right side of their body, Tessa's holding the sheep like she would be holding it for show. And what can happen sometimes is when you give a subcutaneous shot, you can get a little lump. That lump is called a granuloma, especially when you're giving vaccinations. The sheep or the goat is actually going to have an immune response to that, and they're gonna get a little lump. It's not because of an infection or anything like that. It's because of a healthy immune system, and it's an immune response to that shot. So getting a little lump is fairly common, but we always wanna give it here on on the left side, and I don't care if you're raising animals for show or if you're just raising them for your own good, you never know where that animal's gonna go and you never know if someone's gonna wanna purchase that animal from you for show. So always, always, always give that shot down in this area over the ribs. That way, if you do end up with a little lump, they're not gonna be able to see that on the show side. When we talk about weight, when we talk about judging fat cover on the animals, we can jump right into that. We want to feel over top of the ribs, not down here. We want to get right up in here. And I can feel those ribs with my hand. When we're scoring, we can do a one to five or a one to four score. If the animal is super duper thin, you're gonna feel it. It's gonna feel like the top of your fingers. That would be a one. If we're getting a little bit more cover on them, it's gonna feel more like the top of your hand. And then if they're over fat, it's gonna feel like this. So I like to tell people that I like to use my fingers, the top of my hand and the top of my arm to judge fat cover. We don't want it to feel like this. That means they're too thin. We don't want it to feel completely smooth to where we can't feel those ribs at all because that means they're too darn fat. We want it to feel just like the top and back of our hands. This does not tell you fat cover. This is just showing you how much they got in their belly. You may have seen animals before that are big and bloated out. We call that hay belly. That is not telling us appropriate fat cover. You can have an animal that's blown out here in the stomach and still is suffering from undernutrition or malnutrition. You want to feel right here over the top. When we're talking about the belly, that's a great tip that we can talk about when you're getting ready for show. If you've been feeding your animals really, really heavily um, and they've got a little bit too much of a gut on them that you wanna trim down prior to going into show, we want you to start about a week to a week and a half out 
you don't ever, ever, ever want to take hay from them. They always want to get some hay or some roughage. They need that to keep their rumen working properly. If you withhold that hay, what you're going to do is you're end up going to cook and you're going to end up cooking their rumen. The acidity is going to get too high. So when we're getting ready for show and we want to thin them down a little bit, get a little bit of this bulge out of there to give them a more streamlined look, we're going to limit their hay. Notice I didn't say take the hay away. We're going to limit their hay and we're going to give them two big fistfuls of hay per head per day, once in the morning and once at night. That's going to give them enough roughage to keep that room and cooking well and it's going to draw in some of the side. There's no reason for you to withdraw water or hold water back anything like that so we talked about giving shots we talked about giving vaccinations over the rib cage and that brings me to my next point which is the only vaccine that i think you absolutely must give is going to be cdnt that is clostridium and tetanus these are a couple things that you cannot prevent and the reason for that is, is tetanus is everywhere tetanus is in dust it's in soil it can be transmitted by flies and bugs and mosquitoes and things like that a lot of times when people think about tetanus they think Oh, well, as long as they're in a clean area and as long as they don't get any big cuts or anything like that, they're going to be fine. You can get tetanus from a splinter. You can get it just by breathing it in from the soil. So no matter how clean your farm is, you cannot protect an animal from tetanus. So the one shot that I would always advise people to give is going to be CDNT, which is going to protect against various strains of clostridium in the gut and against tetanus. So what are the other two, uh, the clostridium type C and D? Well, that is a gut bacteria that can get out of whack. All it would take is one time for your animal to get loose and get out and overeat or eat something that they're not used to. And what happens is you develop an imbalance of the gut bacteria and that can lead to clostridium. Uh, it can get them when they're young and it can get them when they're a little bit older. And a lot of times it's gonna cause irrevocable damage uh, that is just going to wreck them for the rest of their life. So again, very easy clostridium type C, D, and T. Uh, you're gonna give that following the bottle directions, which is gonna be at about six weeks of life, and then at, again at about eight or 10. And then you can give it to your moms when they are about a month out from having their lambs or kids and it is going to allow them to pass that uh, passive immunity on to their friends. Now, I've got my helper over here. She's gonna bring me a couple bottles. She's got CD and T and she's got penicillin. So the reason that I bring this up is because this brings me to my next helpful tip. When you read the bottle of C, D, and T, a lot of times it's gonna tell you that this bottle is only good for one single use. And that's because it doesn't have anything inside of it that is going to keep bacteria from growing. If you want to utilize these bottles more than once, it's very simple. All you're gonna do is draw up 10 milliliters of penicillin and you are going to inject that 10 milliliters of penicillin into this bottle. Now this doesn't work for all vaccines, but it will work for type C, D, and T vaccine. And that's because of the specific way that it's made. You could never do this with a live vaccine. If you were to put this into a live vaccine, like some of the abortion vaccines, it's actually going to kill it and it's no longer going to work. So just something to keep in mind. You wanna keep it longer? Inject 10 milliliters of penicillin in here and you are good to go. Always make sure you keep it refrigerated. If you're gonna be out on a hot day giving your shots to your flock, make sure you keep it in a little cooler. That way it stays cold while you're using it. Once it gets hot, if you accidentally leave it out, you might as well toss it because it is no longer good. Let's move on to our next points. Next points I wanna make is talking about the overall functionality and performance and structure of your animal. A lot of times we get really, really hung up on, oh, well, this animal's big or that animal's little, and there is way more stuff that you wanna look at when you're looking at your sheep and goats when you're getting ready to buy them. The first point that I wanna make is this. The body conformation of that animal is not going to change. If that animal is really short bodied, if that animal has some defect with them, as they age, that is not going to get better. If they're broken in the back, 
back to where they have a big dip in there. It's not going to get better as they get older. So you need to have a very critical eye when you're looking at your animals when they're babies before you buy them. Now, when I look at overall length of the animal, what I like to find is the last rib. In her case, it's right here. And I like to divide my length of animal in half. So I wanna say, okay, how much do I have in the front and how much do I have in the back? Now she is what I would consider to be maybe a hair short bodied. I always wanna see at least 50% from here to here compared to here to here. That is to say they're evenly distributed. Ideally, I'd like to see 40% and 60%, but that can change based on breed standards. If you find that you've got 60 up front and 40 in the back, that is a problem. You don't wanna do that. You wanna be at at least 50-50. And again, that can change based off of breeds, but that money, that cut, that's worth the money is in this back end. We wanna make sure that we don't cut ourselves short. I don't care if the animal is one day old, six weeks old, a year old, that is not gonna change. That breakdown is going to grow with the animal and you're gonna maintain those lengths as you go. The next thing that you don't look at and people need to look at this is the animal's bite. You can really mess up your flock really bad if you get an animal that is what we say off in the mouth. Now you notice how her teeth are perfectly in line and they line up perfectly with that top palate. What you've gotta watch is sometimes you will find an animal that is parrot mouth, that is to say that that top palate's extended out past the teeth, it can make it really, really hard for them to eat properly. I can't tell you how many times we've seen animals where the buyer says they're just not putting on weight, they're, they're just not doing well, and we look at the teeth and they're way off in the mouth. The other thing you wanna watch for is scissor mouth to where the palate doesn't line up with the bottom. If you see this when they're little, it is going to get worse and worse and worse as they age. So you really, really wanna watch for that. You do not wanna breed that into your flock or into your herd. And this is the same for both sheep and goats. So if you're buying an animal, we always, always, always want you to look at the mouth. Off in the mouth, do not buy it. You don't want those genetics in your flock or herd. The last thing that I wanna talk about is the walk. When these animals are walking, and when Tessa's walking her, what we wanna see is we wanna see them following in their footsteps. When this back leg comes forward, it should be close to stepping in here. It may be right about here, but it should be close to stepping where that front foot is. We call that following their footsteps or walking in their footsteps. We don't want them to be way off. We don't want those back legs to be too close together. We don't want those back legs to be too far apart. So Tess, go ahead and give her a walk. Last thing we wanna talk about is overall body shape. We don't want a really, really deep chest, especially in a baby. What you'll find sometimes is you go to a farm and you'll look at them and you'll say, oh, this animal is really, really big. And what you're seeing is a really deep chest. We want this animal to have a slight V appearance. We want this chest to be nice up and high. We don't want a really, really deep chest. If we find ourselves to where we've got a very boxy animal when it's little, what's gonna happen is it's gonna grow up, but it's not gonna grow as much out. What you wanna see in an animal is a nice tubular shape that's good muscle conformation all the way around. And as that animal grows, they're gonna grow proportionally and they're going to look good. If you look at her back, now she is, she is a little wider in the front, it's just her breed, but we want at least to be even. If not, we want a little bit of a V shape. We don't want these front shoulders to be blown apart. If these points right up front here are too wide, that's gonna be a problem. The reason for that is, is when they're delivering babies, these genetics tend to carry through. And if the front shoulders are too blown apart, this is what's gonna get stuck in mom's birth canal. So we like to see this nice V shape or at least perfectly flat. You wanna have this area filled in here. A big belly can make that look a little shallower than it is and that would refer you back to that first point that we made. The animal should set nice and square off of her points. Um, other than that, that's all that we've got as far as confirmation. Let's get headed out and take a look at some fencing. This is 
This is one of our dry lots that's not in use because all of our animals are out on pasture. And we leave our hay in here, just let it kind of decompose. We'll clean it up this fall. But you can see we let our chickens go through there and dig it up and they will eat any larvae, maggots, anything like that. They aerate it, they stir it up, they poop in it and they will keep it clean. And we don't have any issues. What is this? Well, this is a high tensile fence. I love high tensile fence. It works great. It's cost effective. This is not a barrier. I don't care what anybody tells you. This is not going to keep your animals in. It's not going to keep your animals out. It will 99% of the time, especially if you have sheep. Sheep respect this very well. Sometimes people say, oh, well, if there's enough food in there, they're going to stay in there. No, if, if you've ever raised goats before, you know, the goats want to be where they're not. It happens. Perhaps you get a predator in here and they spook them. You could have the neighbor shooting off fireworks. You could have thunder. You could have whatever. Sooner or later, when it comes to a high tensile fence, your animals are gonna get spooked or they're gonna get curious and they may run through it. They may bolt through it, even though it's gonna shock them. So I want you to remember when you're talking about high tensile fencing, it is not a barrier, not nearly as good as something like woven wire. So make sure that you keep that in mind. When I come up to my high tensile fencing, I'll tell you what, if you don't have one of these, you're gonna to wanna to get one. This is a non-grounding tester. You can pick these up online. There, may, there are many different manufacturers of these. The beauty of this is it not only tells me how much voltage I have going through it. I have the fence turned off right now. Not only tells me how much voltage I have going through it, it also has these direction arrows on here. So if you're like us and you have miles and miles and miles of high tensile fencing, this will actually show you the direction of the short and you can follow it until you get to where the arrow starts to reverse and then you know where your short is. It's like $100, but I'm telling you, well, well worth the money. I don't care which kind you get. You can look these up on Premiere. You can look these up on Amazon. Just check them out. Well, well worth your money. We've talked about this in the past about turning fencing on and off. If you didn't check out our video, our electric fence tips and tricks video, this is a lifesaver right here. This is a kill switch. And you notice I don't have it up at hand level, I have it down at foot level. And that's because if I'm carrying feed or if I'm carrying hay, I can simply come over here with my foot and I can kick it on and right now it's on. Let's see, if I do my tester here, yeah, 9.9 thousand volts. I like to run my voltage at around anywhere between nine and 10 thousand volts. Don't worry, it's not gonna kill them doesn't have any amps, but it does have a lot of voltage. So if they mm, happen to get into things, uh, you don't have to worry about it. It's going to be a strong deterrent. If you have problems with your goats or with your sheep or with your dogs climbing your fence, these spring gates are the way to go. We like to run these spring gates on the inside of our fencing in order to keep the dogs and the goats, especially from climbing up and damaging these. If you have a collection pool, notice this, notice my fencing around my collection pool. This comes off of our gutters and our downspouts. It is not good water and I would not ever feed this to an animal. You cannot keep animals from drinking dirty water. Give your animals clean, fresh water all the time, but I'm telling you, they'll go up and drink out of a mud puddle. If you have an area like this, if you have water that you don't want them to drink out of, you have to do what we did here and you have to fence it off to keep them out. As you can see our Great Pyrenees running into the, running into the picture here. And we're gonna, let's, let's talk about Great Pyrenees since, since we're on the subject. When we talk about this not being a permanent barrier, Again, it's really not. It's a very, very, very strong deterrent. But if you are going to have a farm and you are going to have any kind of fencing, if you're going to have any kind of animals, I absolutely believe that you need to have a dog. Now, we use Great Pyrenees here on our farm. We have used Commodores in the past. We've used Anatolians. I really like the Great Pyrenees. So what's the trick with the Great Pyrenees? You see we have free ranging uh, chickens and things like that. People ask me all the time, they're like, doesn't your dog attack the chickens? Doesn't your dog attack the ducks? The answer is no. And the trick is you have to get them when they're little. You have to get them when they're puppies and you have to raise them with the livestock. Murphy here has been around chickens and ducks his entire life. He doesn't think anything of it because he doesn't look at them as prey. He doesn't look at the cats as prey. He doesn't look at anything else as prey because he's been around them his whole life. So if you're gonna get a dog, 
get it when it is a puppy. Chances are if someone's got an adult dog for sale, it's already got problems and that's the reason that they're getting rid of them. You don't have to be lovey-dovey with these dogs. You have to get them used to being around people, but you don't have to overhandle them as if they are a pet dog. We actually don't want to. We want them to imprint themselves on the livestock. So very, very low maintenance. We bring them out once a day to feed them and that is it. Important point, important tip for you to remember, when you are feeding your dogs, that dog food is very, very high in copper. We don't want to leave dog food out, especially where our sheep can get to it. It can make them very, very sick. It can even kill them. Last point that I want to make about the dogs. Heartworm medication is very expensive. You don't need to buy expensive heartworm medication. The oral drench sheep ivermectin that you can buy in the major farm stores is the ivermectin that you would give a dog in the treatment of heart guard. We are going to include a link to that in the description below. All you need to do is follow the formula that we have in the description below. You draw up a little bit of your ivermectin and you inject it into a piece of hot dog, feed that to them once a month, you are gonna save hundreds and hundreds of dollars by treating your dog for heartworms that way because that bottle of ivermectin is going to last you and your dogs probably their entire lifetime. So make sure you check that out. Do you have a pasture that maybe isn't up to snuff or you're suffering from a drought in your area? Don't worry about it. This pasture is very good grass and very good legumes most of the time but we have suffered a drought this spring and we need more forage. You can plant very specific warm season grasses like tough grass, sorghum grass, Sudan grass, or sorghum Sudan grass into your fields and it will pay dividends. You can hire a local farmer to come in and drill it in or you can drill it in yourself. This sorghum Sudan grass right here is just about a week and a half old. And in just a couple weeks, it is going to be, well, let me rephrase. In about a month, this is gonna be about three foot tall and we're actually gonna to struggle to keep up with it. But what I've done due to the weather here when we were having a drought is I had my local farmer come in and actually drill this in. I did four acres of this and it cost me about $105 plus about $50 to have them drill it in. And this is going to add tons and tons and tons of forage to my field. The other thing that it's going to do is the root structure is going to create tillers and go down, open up and aerate my soil and allow for better fertilization, better natural fertilization when I spread manure and spray compost tea on this later this year. So don't fret. If you have bald spots, if you have dirt spots like this due to a poor pasture, you can simply have someone come in in midsummer and drill in something like tough grass, sorghum Sudan grass. There are some complications that come into play with that, specifically with prussic acid. We wanna watch for frost and things like that. But again, don't feel like there isn't any tools that you have at your disposal that you can use. You can very easily find some warm, warm season grasses to add a ton of tonnage to your feed. Your word of mouth is what keeps us going. If you enjoy our videos, thank you very much. Please, please share them with a friend. Make sure that you give us a thumbs up. Make sure that you join our online forum. If you belong to other online forums, consider telling other people about us as well. Again, we don't market, we don't advertise. You are what keep us going. And if you like our content, please make sure you help us out. Thanks for joining us. People ask me all the time about flies and they're like, is there a natural way to keep the flies down in our barns, in our stables and other places? And the answer is yes. The best way to keep your flies down is to get free range chickens and free range guineas. But they come with problems. If you've ever had free range chickens, guineas, ducks or anything like that on your property, what you've probably noticed is, is they love to get in your flower beds and they love to tear things up, especially inside your potted plants. If you have potted plants and you wanna keep the chickens out, it's as simple as this. Get yourself some high tensile fencing wire, tie it together with a couple of zip ties, and you can simply put these, you can paint them, they look like little flowers or they look like little plants. You can simply take these, put them inside your potted plants, and this will keep your chickens from getting in there and digging the holy snot out of your potted plants and driving you crazy.
It's my light. I've talked about it before in our video shorts, but here it is. Again, you can buy this on Amazon. You can buy this online. This flashes and it makes a clicking noise. It just hooks up to your fence and it hooks up to a ground rod. I can see this flashing light from my front window. I never have to worry if my power is on or if my power is off because I can see it. The other thing is, is the animals can hear it. And when they hear that clicking sound, they know that the fence is on. So this is our Electronet fencing. You can get this at Premier, uh, Ken Cove sells it. Tying your fences together, zip ties. It's just that easy. You drive them in down the bottom, just use a zip tie. When they join, wrap them around opposite one another and just clip the two clips together. This is the easiest way to do it. When we go to move the fence, we just take a pair of diagonal cutters, cut the zip tie, unwrap it, pull it apart. When you're looking at your corners, are you irritated because you can't pull tight corners? Don't be irritated. Just drive a T-post, get yourself a piece of one and a half or two inch PVC and lay it over top of it. Actually, I lied. Get yourself a piece of, yes, I was right, two inch PVC. How about that, Lindy? I got lucky. Get yourself a T-post, drive it in, put your uh, PVC over top of it, and you'll be able to pull nice tight corners. If you're in an area where you're putting fencing, your temporary fencing, chances are you don't have power. Now we're rotating our animals every couple of days uh, between multiple paddocks. We're gonna have eight, 10 paddocks. Right now, this thing is putting out, let's see what we got. 4.8 thousand volts, 5.1 thousand volts. And we're doing that off of a battery setup. If you haven't seen our video about this before, make sure that you check it out here and I will show you how to make this. This is very, very simple. There is no reason to spend a thousand dollars on a solar charger. You can make one yourself for a couple hundred dollars. And when I say a couple hundred dollars, I'm talking about the panel, the battery, the charger, everything else. Everything you need is right here. We're using a pallet, a solar panel, a battery, a ground rod, and a charger. It's just that easy. Again, make sure you check out this video here. Save yourself a lot of time and hassle. So if you look out in the pasture here, you can see that we have quite a few different animals. We've got cattle, we've got sheep, and we've got goats, and they're actually getting ready to move off of this pasture tomorrow. A lot of people ask me, you know, goats need copper, cattle need copper, but sheep can't have it. So how do you manage to keep all of them together? Very easy. Everyone gets free choice sheep mineral, which is lacking in copper. And then we use injectable copper for our cattle and for our goats. We use this, it's called Multi-Min 90. You can get this from your veterinarian. It has manganese, copper, zinc, and selenium in it. You can give them a subcutaneous shot over the rib cage at a, the rate for adults of about one milliliter every six months, and it will give them all the nutritional copper that they need. This can be a lifesaver because it's going to get you away from having to do those darn copper boluses that they like to chew and spit out if you've ever dealt with them before. Scratch that, don't even mess with it, just use the Multi-Min 90. When we talk about raising them out on pasture, you have to remember, no matter how good your pasture is, they still need minerals. They still need a good free choice mineral. Now you can get that from us, from our farm store, go to www.lenessafarms.com, or you can buy it from your local producer. But again, when you've got your sheep, you wanna make sure that it is copper, Free. A lot of people say, oh, well, you know, if you feed them mineral, if you do this, you do that, their hooves are going to grow. <sighs> Don't worry about that. Hoof growth is normal and it's something that's going to happen. If I pull back so much of your nutrition that your fingernails don't grow anymore, trust me, you are not a healthy individual. We're not afraid of hoof growth here. We wanna make sure that they have everything that they need. We wanna make sure they have all their vitamins and minerals and that they have all the nutrients that they need. If you're the kind of person that doesn't wanna feed grain, but you wanna make sure that you're still treating your animals for coccidia, you can also go on our website and we have free choice mineral plus decox that's all in one. You can feed it to them as a free choice mineral and help protect them against coccidia as well. The last point that I wanna make is this. 
don't worry too much about individuals online that tell you that, oh, you have to do it my way or the highway. The way I do it's the right way and the way other people do it is the wrong way. Absolutely not. You wanna expose yourself to as much information as possible. You wanna be a good consumer of good scientifically backed information. You wanna use that and you wanna suit it to your farm. Everyone's farm is different. You may hear people saying, oh, my sheep or my goats are the best and my animals are worm resistant and things like that. That is just not true and I don't care if you like it or if you don't. When I talk about worm resistance, I will tell you this. An individual that is selling you an animal and they say they don't get worms, what they're trying to tell you is, this animal doesn't get worms under my protocol, under my property, on my geographical location. You can very easily buy an animal for someone like Greg Judy, bring it home, throw it on your pasture, it's gonna get worms and it's gonna die. I'm not telling you that there aren't specific breeds that are more parasite resistant than others, but what I'm telling you is, there is no 100% when it comes to raising sheep and goats. Follow us online, go to lanessafarms.com, Join our Facebook forum at Lanessa Farms Tack Box on Facebook. Find other individuals that are reputable and follow them. Glean as much as you can, apply it to your farm, see what works, see what doesn't, keep what works, get rid of what doesn't, and go from there. I don't care if you've been doing this for 20 years or 20 days, there is still stuff that you can learn. If you ever get to the point that you think you know it all, well, you're in trouble. I'm Tim from Lanessa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining me again today, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.